I seek refuge with God Almighty from every form of evil, especially the evil of my own actions, the evil of every satanic creature, whether it be human or a demon, human or jinn. I begin in the name of God, the Beneficent, the Merciful, the one with all attributes of excellence, Sifatul Jamal wa Sifatul Jalal, the attributes that you describe him to be, the beautiful, the kind, the wise, the all-knowing, the all-powerful, the all-merciful, and also the attributes which you negate from him, defaults, de defects, flaws, deficiencies, such as when you say, Laysa kamithlihi shayt, there is nothing like him. There is no similar, nothing that is similar to him in an absolute sense. He is beyond all limitations. He is the independent, the one who is not dependent on anything, the one who is in no need. When we reflect on these attributes, it helps us to realize not only with our thoughts, but also to start to tap into our feelings that we know deep down, but we need something to invigorate those feelings so that we are in touch with them more and more throughout our lives. When we reflect on what it means when we say God, when we say Allah, the one with all attributes of excellence, it helps us come closer to that. I ask God Almighty to accept the little praise that we may offer as we thank Him and we try to show our appreciation for His blessings. But no matter how much we try, no matter how much we thank Him, even our thanks is impoverished and in need of another thank you for the ability to say thank you. So thank you Allah for giving us the blessing and ability to say thank you in every passing moment with every blink of an eye. And so as you realize, dear brothers and sisters, we can never truly show our appreciation to God. All we can do is have a sincere intention trying to do so. And I ask God Almighty to shower peace and blessings upon the chosen ones, those whom they fulfilled the purpose for their creation why God created them. They lived up to the standard that God wanted them to achieve. And so God, knowing that these were the ones who would pass the exam, these were the ones who would be the role models if given the chance, He selected them with His foreknowledge of them. And He made them the prophets and the messengers. And I ask God Almighty to shower peace and blessings upon them all. Those whom God has sent as a prescription of excellence for us all. Walking, talking excellence. Role models for each generation of human beings since the beginning of human life on this earth until the final prophet, the final messenger, the seal of all prophets and messengers, Khatam al Nabiyyin, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. 
But that request, that prayer to God to shower peace and blessings upon them would be incomplete, dear brothers and sisters, unless I also ask God to shower peace and blessings upon the guardians of that message. Those who were not necessarily bringing anything new to the table, but they were guarding the message of the Prophet that is their leader and to whom they are disciples. I am speaking especially of the disciples of the seal of all prophets and messengers, the imams, the guardians, the ones appointed by God, the ones who were the closest in their actions, in their closeness to the seal of all prophets and messengers, that is Muhammad. These are the 12 imams of These are the imams, these are the guardians, who were not simply great scholars, they were not simply righteous individuals. These were the ones who you would have anticipated. With your sensible thinking, with your sound-minded thinking, you would have anticipated that God would appoint a guardian, an impeccable protector of the message, who not only protects the message either in public or behind the scenes, but also lives up to the standard of that message, fulfilling the purpose of guidance that God wants for human beings in every day and age. Whether you know the Imam in public or he's behind the scenes or living incognito with a hidden identity, the, the existence of the Imam is a necessity. By virtue of sound reason and by the prescriptions that we find in the Holy Quran and in the words of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Namely, as you probably all have heard, Hadith al thaqalain in which Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that he would leave behind him two weighty things or two successors. There are variations in the way that this report has been mentioned and reported in <coughs> historical records that are the collections of Hadith. But the key idea is that there are two key things that Prophet Muhammad has left behind. Not only the Qur'an, the living miracle, which is our way, our gateway and our access to knowing what happened back in that time, through the living miracle of the Qur'an right now, but also through a guarantee that will protect the Holy Qur'an and live up to the standard of the Holy Qur'an. That never separates from the Holy Qur'an. And that has many meanings, dear brothers and sisters. Never separates meaning, meaning there will always be somebody from that second group on earth with the Qur'an. It also means that this person or this group of individuals who will never separate from the Qur'an, never deviate from the behavior that the Qur'an prescribes. That means that they are impeccable. They are representatives of the Qur'an not only by a label, by a designation that we may give a title here or there, by a worldly position that some people may have, by this position of this, this particular job that has this title, or that particular secular position that has another title. You're a government position, you're called a president, or you're in a, a ministry, you're called a minister. What are these titles? These titles are worldly. They don't necessarily reflect a reality. A reality that a person is truly a president in the eyes of God or truly a minister in the eyes of God, or truly a sheikh in the eyes of God, or truly a so-and-so in the eyes of God. The ones who are with the Qur'an and never deviate from it are truly the representatives of the Qur'an. They are truly the successors on earth representing God, not simply a label or a designation that could or could not actually apply in reality. These are the ones who were left with the Holy Qur'an on earth. So if ever there was a time in which some people had some confusion and they couldn't figure out who is that particular individual, who is that guardian on earth at any particular time, by this reasoning you'd know that he has to exist. Whether you know his name or you don't know his name. Whether you see him in public or you don't see him in public, he has to be there. He may be choosing to lead behind the scenes. He may be having his own shadow government of sorts. Regardless how he chooses to lead, he must exist. 
It's a sensible position to take. It's the position of sound reason. It's also what is indicated by the verses of the Quran and the heritage of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. Especially when you take into consideration the famous reports that are relayed by the main, the main groups that preserve Prophet Muhammad's narrative. Allah. Allah. I'm speaking of the main groups that preserve Prophet Muhammad's narrative. Allah. That are known as the Sunnis and Shias today. The vast majority of all the extant hadith compilations that we have include a reference to the idea that Prophet Muhammad said there will be Muhammad, 12 leaders. Also there's variations on the wording of this hadith, but the gist of the idea is there will be 12. This particular number, 12. 12 leaders, all of them from Quraysh, from the tribe of Prophet Muhammad. And if you read closely into the different variations of these reports, you also get an indication that there were other things that were said, clarifying who they were in particular. You find them in the sources of the Shia, named exactly who they are, one by one. And in a small minority of the Sunni report, reports, you also find that they are named one by one as our 12 Imams. But you also find, if you were to think about it simply with sound reason, if Prophet Muhammad in front of you were to say there will be 12 leaders, would a sound person simply have just left it at that and not have asked him, who are they, O Messenger of God? What are their names? What are their qualities? What are their attributes? Would you have just left it at that and not asked him anything more about that? This question is something for us to ponder and to think about. Because these types of questions are what give us the justification to question how Sunnis have understood their history. The question of would you have left your business without anybody to take care of it, that you are confident is a competent leader? Would you have left the ship without somebody that is a qualified sailor to navigate the seas? Would you have left the school without a principal to sub in your place? Would you have left a community without its proper leadership? If Prophet Muhammad would never leave, he would never leave even for battles without having somebody that he has appointed. Now whether it's a governor or it's somebody who is in charge of being the, the supervisor of all the governors, the point is, there should be somebody left behind that is qualified. So then, do you think he would have left this world and simply left it to these believers, to these group of individuals who were still being influenced and infiltrated by hypocrites that the Quran refers to in Surah Al-Munafiqeen. The Quran refers to, in an entire chapter, hypocrites that live amongst the Muslims during the days of the Prophet do you think that the, that community was ready to figure out who would be the most qualified leader amongst them? Put, a, put that argument aside. Even if you look at it and think, maybe they were. There's another thing to consider. If you know that God wants for us to have impeccable guidance, why did he send a prophet to begin with? Why didn't he just leave us to figure out things on our own and then just say, well, okay, you tried your best. Let me just give you credit for what you tried to do. Why did he go and send prophets and messengers? Because he wants us to have impeccable guidance. Guidance in the best form, on all levels. And he doesn't simply want it to be a document that we have amongst us. He wants it to be a lived role model amongst us. A person who is a living role model amongst us for us to follow. So that he doesn't give us any excuse that, oh, we didn't, know how to we didn't know how to apply the rule properly. You didn't provide us a guide. You didn't provide us a role model. So God does send the role model. He sent the prophet and he sent the messenger. He gave you the message. He gave you the miracle to show you the proof that this guy is really speaking on behalf of God. But then what? Did, did everything just... 
the need for guidance, they just kind of evaporate when Prophet Muhammad left this world? Sure, we may not need any new software. We have the greatest software there can be. The most updated version, Islam, right? But who is going to make sure that there are no viruses that attack that software? Who is going to make sure that the system is operating as it should be? You know what? He may not even have to be a public personality. But the fact that he can exist, that guardian behind the scenes is enough. Just that we know, you can rest assured there's a guardian behind the scenes that God has placed on earth that can act on God's behalf on earth. So who is that guardian? That's who we call the Imam. The 12 Imams that we believe, the first of whom is Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him. <laughs> At the end of Prophet Muhammad's sermon, وسلم, in welcoming the month of Ramadan, as I mentioned yesterday, according to this famous sermon, the Prophet says, Ya Ali, man qatalata faqad qatalami. O Ali, whoever killed you has killed me. وَمَنْ أَبْغَضَكَ فَقَدْ أَبْغَضَنِي And whoever despises you or has enmity towards you or hates you is actually having that towards me. وَمَنْ سَبَّكَ فَقَدْ سَبَّنِي And whoever abuses you using foul language, cursing you, abusing you is actually doing that to me. لِأَنَّكَ مِنِّي كَنَفْسِي Because you are to me like my, you're from my own soul. You are like my own self. Ruhuka min ruhi, your soul, your spirit is from mine. Watinatuka min tinati, and your nature is from mine. In Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala khalaqani wa iyak wa stafani wa iyak. God, the exalted, has created you and he has created me. He has created me and he's created you. And he has chosen me and he has chosen you. Fakhtarani lil nubuwa. He chose me to be the prophet, that chosen one who's delivering the software. And he chose you for the imama, the guardianship, the leadership. Whoever denies your guardianship, think about it. If you know the need for the guardianship, and you know that Prophet Muhammad has appointed a guardian. <laughs> and then you deny, you reject it. Then actually, what are you actually doing? You're rejecting that this person is actually the Prophet. You're rejecting that he's speaking on behalf of God. You're rejecting that what is being said here is something that is the will of God. Now put aside, some people may not know any better. They may have not been, it hasn't been presented to them properly. Maybe. They have a different way of thinking of it where they don't think that the Prophet appointed Imam Ali or... But at the very least when somebody recognizes how this makes sense and there is proof for it, if you deny that, then you're denying Prophet Muhammad. Ya Ali, anta wasiyi wa abu wuldi wa zawjubnati wa khalifati ala ummati fi hayati wa ba'da mamati أمرك أمري ونهيك نهي أقسم بالذي بعثني بالنبوة وجعلني خير البرية إنك الحجة الله على خلقه وأمينه على سره وخليفته على عباده You are the one to execute O oh Ali, you are the one to execute my will my, You are the father of my children the descendants who will come through you, my descendants you are the husband of my daughter, my son-in-law, and my successor over my community, this nation. Both during my life and after my death. Your command, your command is my command. When you forbid something, it's me forbidding it. When you say no, it's like I'm saying no. I swear by him who made me the prophet and made, you, made me the best of all people, Indeed, you are the proof of God for his creatures, the guardian of his secrets, and the vicegerent presiding over his servants. Imam Ali, peace be upon him, Hujjatullah, 
the proof in God's favor. In one sense, you could say, look, Ali, with his beautiful qualities, with his excellence, with his character, with his devotion, some people may say, look, you know what? Some people may talk about proving God's existence through causality. Some people may talk about proving God's existence through contingency. Some people may say we prove God's existence through our internal, inner, spiritual experience. Some people might say, I prove God's existence when I look at Ali. SubhanAllah. When I look at this beauty, this devotion, this spirit, this excellence that you see in a being which this being admits that he is in need of God. I see such beauty in a creature, and yet this creature is trying to direct me towards his creator. Some people will think that that's enough for them to realize that there's something beyond. God Almighty says in the Holy Quran, and I begin after Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayyuhannas, أنتم الفقراء إلى الله والله هو الغني الحميد O people, you are the ones who stand impoverished before God. You stand in need before God. And God, He is the all-independent. The one worthy of praise. Sometimes just taking one of God's names can make the difference between feeling like your day hasn't ever been any better and feeling like you're down in the gutter. May God keep all folk away from you all. We read these words, we recite these verses, we read the supplications. However, the, the things that can open up for us by simply connecting to even one of the names of God, it's something that is to be experienced and it can only be described in, very, in a very limited way. One time I, was, I heard from one of, my, one of my teachers a very important phrase that stuck with me. He said, one of the great scholars who was known as a mystic and a philosopher and a theologian, he was able to develop everything he said, basically revolving around one word that is one of the names of God. And that name is Al-Ghani, the one who is in no need, the one who is completely independent. Because it's this word, perhaps, that if you reflect on it, it will bring you to understand how God's existence is not only provable, it's not only provable, it's, it's something that is indispensable if you want to even consider how you exist yourself. Think about it this way. Right when you realize you have a need, what does need mean? Need is a meaning that hinges on something else. It doesn't just exist on its own. It's like when you say in. What does in mean? I am. Like inside something. You have to think of something and then you think of the idea of how in describes a relation between <coughs> something and another thing. That you're describing something's inside of it. When you say something is out, out, out of what? You have to describe it hinging on something else. Similarly, the idea of need itself hinges on something else. There's a, an end which needs, and another end, it's the thing that you need. So need is linking between me and what I do need. So the very notion that when you realize you need, you have a need, you have a limitation, you have a deficiency. Just by feeling that, you're actually, deep down, feeling what you're needing. Sometimes when you, you think about it, you may not always come to the right answers in explaining it about what it is you actually need. But the feeling is there, 
and that's something that you can't doubt because otherwise me need would have would it, wouldn't mean any would it have any kind of it wouldn't have any reasonable meaning to it so it's one of the things that they call al ma'an al harfiya meanings that hinge on other things they don't exist on their own like when you say tree tree you can imagine tree on its own generally you can imagine book on its own but you can't imagine certain ideas other ideas on their own except in relation to other things one of those ideas is this idea of need because when you think of the need that you feel my need my need there's something I'm needing we've been reflecting on Munajat Amir al-Mu'mineen peace be upon him, according to some of the earliest or extant references I found one of the most early, the earliest extant reference I found of this is in Al-Mazar by Al-Mashhadi who is a 6th century after Hijrah scholar, 12th century in the common era. Of course there's another discussion why, why these references of, to the supplications have not been even earlier than this. There are many different reasons. One of the reasons perhaps is that a lot of the, the earlier manuscripts were lost uh, in different circumstances when libraries were burnt down or because they were not copied uh, because the later books were became the widespread books amongst the people so there was no need to copy down the earlier versions whatever the reason this is a famous supplication attributed to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam we talked about the first two lines I mentioned how the first segment of this supplication talks about asking for safety and security for protection we got to the third line and then the second part of the supplication I think one of the best ways to describe it would be it reflects on our need it reflects on this feeling of need and why did I particularly choose this supplication to talk about because I want it to be a segue into how can we best benefit or try to get more benefit out of dua al jawshan al kabir that we recite in Layal al-Qadr in the nights of Qadr as you many many of you practice it inshallah one of the acts that, that has been mentioned is the act of reciting Dua al-Jawshan al-Kabir but it's very long right so I was thinking what is one of the ways we can kind of reflect on how to get a better sense of what it means when we say Ya when we're calling out Ya and as then we start mentioning the names of God. Oh! And then you start mentioning all the different names of God. And one of the ways perhaps to do this is by reflecting on this munajat of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Look at the third line here. What does it say? It says, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-aman wa as'aluka al-aman yawma يُعْرَفُ الْمُجْرِمُونَ بِسِيمَاهُمْ فَيُؤْخَذُ بِالنَّوَاصِ وَالْأَقْدَامِ A reference to Surah, surah Al-Rahman, verse 41. I ask you for safety and protection on the day in which the, those, the criminals, the guilty will be recognized by their mark. So they will be seized by, their forelock, by the forelocks and the feet. So let's think about this together. Can we hide on, the, on that day? Can we hide? If there's a way to recognize us and everything is being exposed. Notice in Dua Abi Hamza Thamali, one of the things that we say in opposition to what I just read here, because we're talking about when we're still in this world, you say in Dua Abi Hamza, Ilahi qad satarta alayya dhunuban fi dunya. Oh God, you have covered up the sins I've committed in this world, some of my sins. But I am in greater need for you to cover them up for me in the hereafter. So in this world, you didn't expose my sins to the righteous servants of yours. 
So I ask you on that day not to expose my sins in front of everyone when you're going to expose everybody. Notice in this world, some of us, God forbid, may be hanging out with the wrong crowds. We may not be hanging out with the righteous people who avoid sins. So maybe when we come to the mosque or when we hang out with righteous people, they don't know what we've done. They don't know the sins that I've committed. God has concealed those sins from the righteous people. I ask you, God, just as you have concealed my sins from the righteous people in this world, on that day when I'm in a greater need, don't expose my sins. This is in Dua Abi Hamza. But back to Dua, the Munajat of Amir Mu'mineen. On the day of judgment, the Quran describes that those, the criminals, the wrongdoers, they'll be exposed. And then you continue, وَأَسْأَلُكَ الْأَمَانَ يَوْمَ لَا يَجْزِي وَالِدٌ عَنْ وَلَدِهِ وَلَا مَوْلُودٌ هُوَ جَازٍ عَنْ وَالِدِهِ شَيْئًا when a father shall not, I ask you for safety and protection on that day, when a father shall not atone for his child, nor the, nor the child shall atone for its father in any, in any ways. The child will not be able to do his father, save his father, or the, the father may not be able to save his son. Indeed, God's promise is true. And the last one I wanted to mention here for now, is he says, وَأَسْأَلُكَ الْأَمَانِ يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ الظَّالِمِينَ مَعْذِرَتُهُمْ وَلَهُمُ اللَّعْنَةُ وَلَهُمْ سُوءُ الدَّارِ وَأَسْأَلُكَ الْأَمَانِ يَوْمَ لَا تَمْلِكُ نَفْسٌ لِنَفْسٍ شَيْئًا وَالْأَمْرُ يَوْمَ إِذَنْ لَلَّهِ وَأَسْأَلُكَ الْأَمَانَ يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ وصاحبته وبنيه لكل امرئ منهم يوم إذ شأن يغنيه. Each of these I read three of them together now. Each of them has its own emphasis, but because for the sake of time, I just want to combine one of the key themes in them. You're basically saying, and this was the main theme I wanted for tonight, was to survive, we would be willing to do anything. At least that's what it looks like. Yesterday, the theme was safety and security is a priority. Today the theme is, in order to survive, you'd be willing to do anything. That's why in the supplication, the human being would be like, as the Qur'an is describing, because these are references to the Qur'an and the supplication, that on that day in which people would be willing to give up everything, they run away from their parents, they run away from their children, they run away from their siblings, they run away from their spouses. Imagine you running away from those people that are the closest to you that you used to care so much about. That in another part of this it says, وَأَسْأَلُكَ الْأَمَانِ يَوْمَ يَوَدُّ الْمُجْرِمُ لَوْ يَفْتَدِي مِنْ عَذَابِ يَوْمِ إِذٍ بِبَنِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَأَخِيهِ وَفَصِيلَتِهِ الَّتِي تُؤْوِيهِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ يُنْجِيهِ كَلَّا إِنَّهَا لَظَى مَزَّاعَةً بِالشَّوَى I'll read this last part because it's very powerful. Especially, though they will be placed within each other's sight, the guilty one will wish he could ransom himself from the punishment of that day at the price of his children, his spouse, and his brother, his kin which has sheltered him. Basically, well, he's willing to give up all of this. Just take, just let me survive, let me save myself. Take my children, take my spouse, take my everything. And he would be willing to give up everything on earth just to save himself on that day. But the real reflection, dear brothers and sisters, then comes when God says in the Quran, never, according to the translation, never, indeed, it is a blazing fire. Why would God who is not in need of anything, why would he create us? To punish us, to throw us into fire? Why? What does he get out of that? He doesn't get anything out of that. He wants the best for us. He wants to give us paradise. So why would he be speaking in this way to us? Perhaps, perhaps as a parent, as a loving parent, is trying to be a good parent, is also a wise parent, and doesn't spoil his children or her children, and tries 
to give them hints and reminders so that they realize what drastic consequences there are. It's not like it's just something that, okay, just erase it, erase it off of the page. There could be something that is like you getting to an accident. It's a reality in this world that God is telling us there is going to be a blazing fire. Watch out. Now notice how people are perhaps on that day willing to give up everything just to survive. Wouldn't it have been much easier if we were just to give up everything in this day, today, to survive? Why do we have to wait until that day so we regret it? Why can't we start today and make a change for the better? Do I feel like there's so much to do and so much to change? To feel like I can't do anything is even worse. Let me make some sure and steady progress. It's better than not making any progress at all. With the intention, I can start to make the change. And what better an opportunity than the month of Ramadan? The spiritual new year, the holy month of Ramadan. Now reflecting on how some of these people would be willing to give up everything on that day to save themselves, there were some people that we remember in these nights because of their wretchedness, because of their wicked act, because of their evil choice making, as evil as evil can get. Their choice making was that they were willing for the cheapest of prices to give up everything. Ibn Muljam, may God expel him from his mercy because of his crime. Ibn Muljam was one of those who for the cheapest of prices, he gave up a clear conscience. He gave up, he gave up the opportunity to be on the right side of history. Why? For what? Towards somebody who used to give him, who used to be benevolent and generous to him, to such an extent that they say Imam Ali would recite verses of poetry saying, I want to give him, and I want his life, and he wants my death. To such an extent that some reports would say, who, or that Ibn Mujib himself thought, oh, maybe he means me. Let me go and tell him, here, oh, oh Ali, Take off my hands, kill, sever my hands, and kill or kill me. Because he was worried maybe Imam Ali was hinting at him. But Imam Ali, according to those reports, would say, How would I why would I punish you if you have not done anything wrong to me? Why would I do something wrong to you if you have not done anything wrong to me? And even if I knew that you would be the one to kill me, how could I do so before you've actually done it? Imam Ali, peace be upon him, was such a wise individual. They say that Imam Ali, peace be upon him, he knew that this was the one who was going to kill him. And after he struck him, later on when they brought him before him, they say that Imam Ali tell, tells him, I knew that you were the one, but I used to deal with you the way I did, so that it's something that basically that is, it's something recorded. God knows how I treated this person. God knows how I dealt with him and he still committed that sin. And he still dealt with that treachery. Ibn Muljam, dear brothers and sisters, he had many different motives, but one of the key motives that is mentioned in the Arshad by Sheikh al Mufid, one of our earliest scholars, who describes in this book some of the key reports that survived to his day talking about what happened at that time. They say that Ibn Muljam, he had a crush on this lady who was said to be one of the most beautiful women of his time. And he basically tells her, just tell me, what is the bridal gift that you'd like? Anything you ask for, what do you want? And then she was somebody who had enmity in her heart. They say because some of her relatives were killed in a battle where Imam Ali was forced to fight off the enemies of Islam. What was her request? What did she ask? She says she asked for money, she asked for servants, and third, she asked for to kill Ali ibn Abi Talib. But you see, are you surprised that that's what she asked for? Or are you more surprised 
that Ibn Munjam was so willing to sell his soul for something so cheap. Dear brothers and sisters, imagine how low can he go? How low can this man go to give up the commander of the faithful Ali? How could he sell his soul? They say, dear brothers and sisters, after he struck Imam Ali, when they brought Ibn Muljam, they caught him. When they brought him before Imam Ali, Imam Ali would tell them, as they say, don't do anything harmful to him. If I die, then it's one soul for one soul, based on the rules of God. You don't do anything more than that. And if I survive, then I will know how to deal with him. Imagine if Imam Ali survived, do you think that he would have killed him? Or do you think he would have pardoned him? Imagine, dear brothers and sisters. But then how did Ibn Muljam respond when he heard Imam Ali? He says, Wallah, laqad ibta'atuhu bi'alf, wa sammamtuhu bi'alf, fa'in khadalani fa'ab'adahu Allah. He says, basically he's trying to brag about what he did with all this evil in his heart. He says, I paid a thousand for the sword, I paid a thousand for the poison, it better work. Basically, this is what he's saying. They say then, nay, Um Kulthum, the daughter of Imam Ali said, O oh, enemy of God, you killed the commander of the faithful, you killed the prince of the believers, peace be upon him. And then he responds to her with this viciousness, no, I killed your father. Then she responds to him, O oh, enemy of God, I hope that he survives this. And then he sees that Um Kulthum is crying with tears going down her cheeks. And then he's, she's like, he's like, oh really? Basically he's telling her, oh really? Then who are you crying for if you think he's gonna survive? You're crying for me? Wallah laqad darabtuhu darabatan law qusimat baynan al ardi ma'anakatun He starts to say, oh I struck him so hard. If this strike were to be distributed amongst the people of earth, it would have hurt them all. Dear brothers and sisters, imagine what viciousness was in this heart. What have you done, O oh son of Muljam? What have you done, O oh son of Muljam? You struck prayer itself when you struck him. You struck prayer itself when you struck him. He was the guardian of every orphan in this nation. He was the reminder of our Lord, master of creation. What have you done, O oh Ibn Muljam? What a crime, you turned your back on him. وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل بيت محمد من يقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين والله we ask you for the sake of Prophet Muhammad and his family to accept the little that we have offered to give the rewards of this after you perfect it with your bounties and your blessings to give the reward to the living Imam of our time to hasten the appearance of the twelfth Imam to make us amongst the sincere servants in the time of his ghaybah, in the time of his hidden identity, and as well as when he makes himself publicly known. We ask you, Allah, to give us the knowledge, the love and the will to do what is right, to live up to the example that Imam Ali alayhi salam wants us to follow. We ask you, Allah, to give us sincerity and to give us an end that is good in this life, not to let us leave this world before you are pleased with us. And the last of our prayers was Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Azzati Amma Yasifun Wa Salaamun Ala Al-Musayyeen Wa Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa Sallallahu Ala Sayyidina Wa Nabiyina Muhammad Wa Ala Ahli Bayti Al-Tayyibin Al-Tahirin